The Lord's been pressing something on me. I've had several conversations and got some emails that have really um, been on the same issue. And uh, this passage of scripture was just screaming in my mind. And so the Lord brought me there and we pray that we'll all be helped here. Um, John chapter 5. Starting with verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, an Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I am going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. I see so much in this, again, the primary meaning of this, Jesus, as he was known to do, healed a man who couldn't walk. Ah, but I see more in this, and so let's look at it. So starting with, you know, verse 1 and 2, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roof colonnades. Now, I wanted to see what this looked like because I I was trying to get a picture of this. So I looked, um, looked at pictures, read about it. And uh, basically, you know, what you have here is um, there's a multitude of columns. So columns going uh, right next to each other and they would make a rectangle shape. And in the center, kind of like a courtyard situation, there would be a pool. And these colonnades, these uh, pillars that went up, they would all have roofs on top of them. And the people would be laid out on the sidelines. You kind of get a picture of this. So um, there were five of these roofs, five of these colonnades. And there's all these people laid out there. I just want you to see. In these lay a multitude of of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. So these colonnades are filled with people. The people are all disabled in some way. Now, some of y'all know I teach special education in elementary school. Um, And the term uh, special ed or disability is a very wide, thrown around term. Basically, all kinds of people can claim they have a disability. Some of these kids just are disobedient and need some discipline and some love. But there are some who have like a severe disability, a severe um, handicap, a severe issue. And so these people that are being spoken about here are severe in their need. They were called invalids. I looked up what this means. Basically, it means without power, without strength, feeble unable to help themselves. They were invalid. I mean, you're, 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 you're looking at people who were blind, people who were lame, people who were paralyzed. These were weak people. They were powerless. Now, it's true that everyone is weak to some degree, but these people had a severe case of weakness, blind, paralyzed, lame. And this truly describes, in a spiritual way, all people before they came to Christ. And some people who are possibly in this room who have not come to Christ. All people born into Adam are weak, are invalid. You're blind. You're unable to see the reality of your sinful situation. You're unable to see the beauty of Christ. You're lame. You're unable to run to the cross. You're unable to walk the narrow path. You, you're helpless there, paralyzed. 
You ever seen someone who's paralyzed? They cannot move. People are paralyzed from the neck down. They are helpless. This is the true state of all people born. Until you see yourself in this crowd, you'll think that you're actually healthy and fine. You really need to see yourself as being one of these people in order to be helped. Um, I remember I was studying the Black Death. I don't know if y'all ever heard about it. The Black Plague, the bubonic plague, it was a very, very serious thing. And uh, during that time, what would happen is, there, you know, the people would live in the houses. And if someone in the house was found out to have the plague, then the house would be marked. And the house was marked, then the doctors would know this is a house that needs help. Now, some of the people... They didn't want that because the reality of you dying, the reality of you being, uh, you know, outcasted, set aside, people not wanting to be around you was there. And so some people would have the plague and not tell anybody. And they were less likely to get help. They wouldn't get help. The reality that you have to first and foremost acknowledge yourself, see that you would see yourself as the blind, as the lame, as the paralyzed and not as the healthy Verse 5, one man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. I mean, think of this. This man has been like this for 38 years. How depressing is that? How uh, that, would, that, that, that would take away hope. That would take away joy. That, that, to, to be in that situation for 38 years is a very, very, um, it's, it's a sad thing. But again, on a spiritual level, how long have you been in your sin? How long have you been in your chains? How long in your filth? Talk about some of the jobs that I've had. I, I used to be a, a caregiver. And as a caregiver, what I, what I would do is I would go to certain people's homes and I would care for them because they couldn't care for themselves. So I would do things like I would bathe them, I would help them use the restroom, clean up that, brush their teeth. They were not able to clean themselves because they were invalid. Now, during this time, these people did not have the luxury of having someone like me come to them and clean them. They were filthy. This man laid in his filth. He was poor. This was not a rich man. This was not a man who had people to carry him around. He was a poor man. He was filthy. How long has he laid in his filth? 38 years. But think of you. How long have you laid in the filth of your sin? How long have you been in the chains, the slavery? Some of you have been in your sin so long you don't even notice it anymore. You ever walk into a room that is, is foul? There's a foul smell there. And at first, as soon as you walk in, your, your nostrils just cringe up and your eyes are like, whoa, that's, that's terrible. But if you stay in there long enough, you come to get accustomed to it. You don't even realize that it, you were in a room that smelled until someone else walks in and comments on it. It's possible for you to be in sin so long that you don't even realize that it's filthy. You don't even notice how disgusting it is. You don't even recognize your own sinful state. How long have you been in your sin? We get used to things like that. Well, have you? 38 years, unable to walk, paralyzed, blind. Verse 6, when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? I mean, this just blows my mind. Christ saw him. Now, as you read through the gospel, sometimes you'll notice some people see Jesus or they're looking for him. But this is not that kind of situation. This is a situation where Jesus sees him. It's beautiful that Christ sees us. Now, you may, not have, you may not have known this. This may be new information to you that Christ actually sees you, that he seeks you, that he looks for you. But notice this. Jesus sees you as you're lying in your filth and sickness. Think of this. If you walked into your home, and you saw a roach 
on your kitchen table, what would you do? I mean, it's there. It's injured in some way, so it can't run away. But you see this filthy, disgusting thing on your kitchen table. What would you do? I mean, you would not hesitate to smash it, would you? You would crush it as quickly as possible and get rid of any evidence that it was ever there because you're disgusted by this thing. Everyone hates roaches. It's a universal thing. Again, my jobs. I used to do pest control. No one ever said, can you kill the mosquitoes but leave the roaches? Everyone wanted the roaches gone. Why? Because they're disgusting. Everything about them is disgusting. They're filthy. They're dangerous. Everything they touch becomes unclean. The very thought of a roach. Right now, some of you may be shuddering just thinking about them because they're that disgusting. But you know what? You and I are born with a nature that makes us, in God's eyes, more disgusting than roaches in our eyes. You love the darkness just like them. You love the filth of your sin just like they love the filth of trash. And you enjoy it. You, you can take a good deed, a kind action. You can take something as pure as love, get your hands on it, and turn it into something unclean. Something as pure as love, you can distort it with selfishness and pride and lust. Just like they can touch something as clean as freshly washed dishes and turn it into something where you can't even eat on it. But you are worse than a roach in this way. God never told roaches, don't be like that. He never gave them a command and said, you need to be cleaner. But he's given you commands. He's given you mercy upon mercy. He's never given roaches that. He's given you grace upon grace. He's never poured that on them. He has offered you salvation in the very person of his son. And how often have you rejected it and said, I don't want none of that? That's, that's, that's worse. If you would walk into your home, see a roach injured on the table and not hesitate to crush it, What do you think God, the holy, pure, and righteous God, looking at you in your filth, in your sin, in your wickedness, lying there, basking in it, enjoying it? Well, what do you think would be righteous and just for him to do? And yet, Christ sees you And rather than smashing you where you stand, rather than crushing you as you lie in your sin and enjoy it, he comes to you in mercy and grace, just like he did to this man. Even though he sees you in the midst of your rebellion and sin, he still comes to you in kindness. He says to this man, do you want to be healed? I mean, isn't that kind of a strange question to ask to a man who is lame? I mean, wouldn't you think the obvious answer would be, well, of course, (laughs) it seems automatic. But ask yourself, do you really want to be healed? Some of you have grown so accustomed to your sin that you rather, you've kind of grown fond of it. You rather enjoy it. You, you, You like your sin. And to be healed, to be saved would mean you got to get rid of that stuff. You, you actually like your idols. You, you've grown fond of them. And if, and if Christ were to heal you, you would have to destroy them. Do you want to be healed? To be in that condition, to be pitied. Everyone would no longer pity you. It means that that attention, that attention that you get for being, oh, he's an alcoholic and everyone feels bad for you. Oh, you know, she, she, she's had such a hard life. Just, just let her continue to do that. If you were to be healed, you would no longer have that pity, no longer have that attention. You would be free from those things. Do you actually 
want to be healed? Do you want that? Or do you like that condition? Do you like what comes from that? Do you want to be healed? He was in that state for 38 years. I'm only 32. That's longer than I've even been on this earth. Some of you have been in your sin longer than some of us have been alive. And you like it. It's how you identify yourself. I have friends. And they identify themselves so much with their sin that they cannot separate their sin from their identity. I have a brother who's, he practices homosexuality. And he says, you cannot separate me from this thing. If you, dis, if you reject this, you reject me. And he's not the only one. There are others who take that same approach. They are so attached to their sin that they don't want to be healed. Because to be healed would mean to be separated from that which they love. Do you want to be healed? That's not a, it's not a crazy question. That's a real question. Some of you are still unsaved. And it's not because Christ is unable or even unwilling to save you. It's because in order to be saved, you have to let go of your self-righteousness. You have to let go of your self-reliance. You have to let go of your pride. You have to let go of everything that you have been holding on to your, your whole life. And you like it. Do you want to be healed? Some of y'all know that my daughter was... In the hospital recently, praise the Lord, she's not there anymore. The righteous, the effectual prayers of the righteous avail much, truly. But when she was in the hospital, you know, I looked around and I started to look. I was like, you know what? People in the hospital, you know what they get? They get a bed. They get meals. They get TV. Put their feet up. People waiting on them hand and foot. But you know that will only last as long as you're sick. When my daughter was given a, hey, we don't know what's wrong with her, and all the tests came back normal, they said, she got to go. Because only sick people can stay in the hospital. If you're healed, you don't get that comfort. Do you want to be healed? Or do you like the comfort that comes from being in the hospital, so to speak? Do you like that? Do you want to be healed? Jesus asked him that. He's been laying there 38 years. Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be healed of your sin? Do you want to be healed of your pride or do you like it? Do you want to be healed of your anger or does it feel good? Do you want to be healed of your unforgiveness or do you want to hold on to it because, hey, Father's Day passed. I, he hasn't been a father to me in my whole life. I'm holding on to that bitterness. You like to hold on to your lust. It feels so good. I, I don't know if I want to let this go for Jesus. Do you want to be healed? Or will you hold on to that sin as you're thrown into the flames of hell? Because that's what happens to people who don't want to be healed. Verse 7. The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm going, another steps down before me. Background information on this. There was a belief that this pool was visited by an angel every now and then. And when the angel would come down, into this water, the water would stir. And it was the belief that immediately after the water stirred, the first person to get into that water, no matter what disease they had, they would be healed. If you could get into that pool immediately after the water was stirred, you were healed. So he's saying here, I have no one to put me into the pool 
when the water is stirred up. And while I am going, another steps down before me. You notice he didn't even answer Jesus' question. Jesus asked, asked him, do you want to be healed? And he starts talking about the pool. That's an interesting. <laughs> In fact, what he started to talk about was why he wasn't healed yet. Do you want to be healed? Well, this is why I'm not healed. Nobody puts me into the pool and I can't get there before somebody else. No one will carry me, and I'm not faster than the rest. Translation, my efforts are empty, and no one around here has been able to save me yet. No one here can save me. No one has saved me. Maybe they can't. And I'm not, I'm not strong enough. My efforts just don't cut it. I mean, isn't this just a picture of you? <laughs> His hope, I mean, think about this. His hope was in a filthy pool. Imagine how disgusting that water must have been. Again, this place was filled. It said it was a multitude. That's a lot of people. It was filled with people who were lame, blind, and paralyzed. People who were drenched with their own stench from the heat of the day, people who could not clean themselves. They was, were poor people. They did not have the luxury. And as soon as this water stirred, all of these people jumped in. So all the filth that was on them was in this water. Any disease that was on them, anyone who was, you know, had leprosy or whatever, again, all manner of people had all manner of diseases and wanted to be healed of this. So they were in this water. This water was not clean. It was filthy. And their mindset was, if I can get into this filthy water, then maybe I'll be clean. It's filthy. His other hope was in someone else who would put themselves aside and be strong enough to save him. What was the problem? The problem was he was surrounded by people who were in the same shape he was. They were just as lame as he was. They were just as paralyzed as he was. How could they help him? They couldn't help themselves. It's like the, 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 par the proverb goes, the blind man cannot lead the blind man. They'll both fall into a ditch. How can someone who's paralyzed help someone else who's paralyzed? They can't pick them up. They can't pick themselves up. Are you hoping in hopeless things as well? Perhaps you're hoping in the filthy pool of your good works to try to clean yourself. You know, it's like uh, I heard it said before. You know, it's like you're, you're trying to remove the stain with a darker dye. That's not going to remove the stain. If you are sinful and you're trying to do some good works to become unsinful, that's not going to help you. Once you're sinful, you cannot become perfect. Once you're imperfect, you cannot become perfect again. There's nothing that you can do to remove the sin that dwells within you. You do not have the ability to clean yourself. It's like diving into this filthy pool in hopes that is going to save you, that is going to heal you, that is going to clean you. It's going to do nothing but make you more filthy, make you more dirty, make you more sick. I mean, you think about that. You dive into a pool where people had leprosy, not only are you still sick yourself, but now you have the leprosy that was in that water on you. The more you try to come self-righteous, the more you try to atone for your own sins with your own righteousness, you become even more self-righteous. You become more prideful. You become more sinful, more wicked. Your attempts at saving yourself with your own works only makes it worse. Or perhaps you're hoping in some man... Some preacher, if I can just listen to enough Paul Washer sermons, then that will save me. If I can just read enough Charles Spurgeon books, then that will help me. 
But if you can talk to Spurgeon or Washer, they would both tell you, away with this thought. We do not have any ability to help you. Listening to us talk is not where the hope lies. Reading what we wrote is not where hope lies. It lies in Christ. In Christ alone, my hope is found. Place your hope in the only one that is able and willing to save you. And notice that he's willing. Notice that this man wasn't even interested in Christ. He wasn't saying, yes, if you would touch me, or if I could touch the hem of your garment, or if you would say to me, be healed, I'll be healed. He wasn't talking in that way at all. In a way, it's like he wasn't even interested in Christ. Christ comes on the scene, approaches him, because he's not looking for him. He's not approaching him. He, ta- he engages this man in conversation. Do you want to be healed? And he doesn't even in any way pay any attention to Christ, put any affection on Christ, any looking to him, he looks to the pool. <laughs> well, no one put me in there and I can't get there. He's standing, rather, he's laying next to the one who has all ability to save him and he's paying no attention to him. I mean, Christ has every right to say, I'm done with you. He could walk away from him. I mean, this is kind of like the rich young ruler. Like, you have the, the, the healer next to you and you're looking elsewhere. The rich young ruler had treasure incarnate, if you will, right next to him, and he's like, I'm going to hold on to this. I'm looking at the little treasure in my hand. Christ is so kind and so patient and so merciful that he didn't say, you know what, this is, this is terrible. I'm offering you healing and you're looking over there. He doesn't depart from him. He doesn't cast him off. He doesn't rebuke him harshly, which is what he deserved. His theology was not correct. His affections were elsewhere. His faith was weak and distorted. Yet, Christ loved him anyway and continued to pursue him. That's the Christ that is willing and able to save you. That is calling out to you. Do you want to be healed? It's the same Christ. Jesus said to him, Get up, take up your bed, and walk. Now, what do you think would have been going through his head at this moment? I, I was thinking possibly something like, I can't. I can't walk, sir, because if I could, then I would have already been in that pool or I wouldn't be laying here for 38 years. I'm thinking maybe he said something like that in his mind. I don't know. But that's, that's what I would have thought would have gone through his mind if he's laying there for 38 years and, he, and this man that he doesn't know just comes to him and says, get up, take up your bed and walk. Somebody may look at that and say, that's cruel. Why, why, why would you say that to a man who's laying there who can't walk? Why would you tell him to get up, take up his bed and walk? Notice Jesus told him to do the very thing that he couldn't do. If he was blind, he would have said, look. If he was deaf, he would have said, listen. But this man could not walk and he told him, get up. Take up your bed and walk. He hadn't walked in 38 years. Like I said, you know, I used to be a caregiver, and, and uh, one of, the, one of the, the men that I used to help, he hadn't walked in 10 years, and his legs were atrophied. They, they were skin and bone. There was no muscle there. If, if, if he was to look at his legs, if Jesus told him, get up, take up your bed and walk, and he looked at his legs, he would have said, uh, no, that's impossible. I can't. He had every reason to doubt that he could actually do this. This was an impossible thing Jesus was telling this man to do. He was telling a man who was lame for 38 years to get up, take up your bed and walk. And yet, Christ says it. But is this any different than what the Lord is telling you today if you are in your sin? 
Be free from your sin and escape the wrath of God. Flee from the wrath to come. How? I can't. How can I do that? How can someone escape wrath that is inescapable? I mean, we, we, you, if you've ever read Revelation, you'll see it. The people are, cr- may, the, will the rocks fall down on us? Why? Because they want to try to get away from him who is on the throne. They want to get away from his face. But that's not going to do it. How can you get away from the one who is everywhere? These chains have been on me for 38 years. I've been a slave to sin my whole life. I've tried everything. How can I be free from this? How? That's impossible, Jesus. I can't be free. I can't get up. But Jesus says, get up. There's only one way when Christ calls you to not doubt but believe. Have faith. Trust his word and obey. When he says repent and believe the gospel, do it. Don't reason away all the reasons why this isn't going to work. I mean, isn't that exactly what this man could have done? He could have looked at his legs and said, nope. That's, that's, that's not going to work. He, he could have looked at the pool and said, well, I, I, I've seen that work. I, I've seen people go in there and come out healed. I, I think I'm going to keep my, my, my hope over there. He could have looked at his bed and said, you know what? Laying here, people give me money. They feel bad for me. This is what I've known. It's what I've done my whole life, 38 years. I mean, hey, you know what? This is comfortable. People don't like change. I'm going to have to change everything. I know all these people here. We've all been out this pool for a minute. I know them. I'm comfortable here. He could have looked at all of these reasons as justification for not Listening to what Christ said. This is an impossible thing, and yet he didn't do that. And I will call you to do the same thing. Don't reason away this call to faith in Christ. You 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 can look at your you you can look at the bondage that you've been in your whole life and say. I don't know if he can really do it. You can look at all of your efforts. I've tried the repentance thing. I've tried wept. I've tried the praying thing. I've tried to go to church. I've tried it all and none of it has worked. I've done this too long. 38 years I've been in this. You know what? I don't want to be disappointed again. You can look at so many things. If I get up, I'm going to have to leave everyone I know. I'm going to have to leave my family. I'm going to have to leave my friends. They're not going to accept me if I follow him. They don't, they're not going to want me if I turn away from my sin. You know what? When, when I was in bondage to sin and I used to smoke weed all the time, many of my friends were because I smoked weed. When I stopped smoking weed, we had nothing in common and all those friends vanished. You may be thinking the same thing. The friends I have are because I do these things. You're calling me away from these things? That means you're calling me away from these friends. I grew up as a Muslim. My family were not, they were not too pleased with me following Christ. And that meant certain of my family members didn't want anything to do with me anymore. Some of them still don't. And you may be saying the same thing. Hey, I grew up Catholic. I grew up this. I grew up that. Hey, you know what? If I follow him, if I get up from everything I know, that means I'm not going to have them anymore. Count the cost. Do you want to be healed? If you want to be healed, that means you got to get up, take up your bed, and walk. Look to Christ and be saved. And what happened? And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. He believed the Lord. Hey, if any of you have been coming on Sunday, you have heard Pastor Tim say it. You've been reading 
Uh, Hebrews 11, you see it. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. This man is not because he was, not because there was anything beautiful about him. It's not because there was anything wise about him. It's not because God looked down the corridors of time and saw he would do some good deeds or he would come to him. No, it, there was nothing in this man that was pleasing. But I tell you this, he believed. He believed the words of Christ and he was healed because of it. He had faith. He believed the Lord. He had faith in Christ and that which was impossible with man, that which he had been trying to do for 38 years and failed in an instant, instantly looked to Christ. He believed his word and he was healed. He was saved. Jesus said, that which is impossible with man is possible with God. I plead with you, will you stop making the gospel so complex? Some of you, you're making it too complex, and it's a simple message. Are you lame? Are you dead? Are you sick? Are you blind? Are you sinful? Are you lost? Christ is telling you, believe, believe the gospel, believe that he is sufficient. His perfect life, is that enough to please God or do you need to add more? If you need to add more, you don't want to be healed. If his perfect life is enough to be righteous in the eyes of almighty God, believe it. Was his death the wrath that he bore, the blood that he shed, was it enough to atone for your sins? Or do you need to add your own penance and your own suffering and your own efforts? Are you trying to pay God back? Or will you say, Christ paid it all and I will trust in that alone? His resurrection from the dead Is that evidence enough that the father received his sacrifice as sufficient? Or are you looking for something else? Are you looking for more signs? Believe the gospel. The simple words of Christ. Stop looking to everything else. Get up. Believe the gospel. Take up your bed, repent of your sin, and walk. Follow Christ and live a holy life empowered by the Spirit of God. Well, that's the, that's the call to you today. Believe the gospel. Believe the simple truths and promises of the gospel. Believe his simple words. No matter how impossible your situation has looked, no matter how long you have been in your filth, no matter how many things you have tried and tried and tried again, Christ says, if you will get up, take up your bed, and follow him and walk. If you will believe on him, you will be saved. Well, Father, Lord, I pray. Again, I'm just a man. I cannot make the lame walk. I cannot make the blind see, but you can. And Lord, if if they would simply trust you, if they would place their complete and total faith in you, if they would cast themselves upon Christ, they would be saved. I pray, Lord, that those in this room Those who have heard this would do such things that they would trust you. 
Jesus' name, amen. Will God help you? You're dismissed.